mean, every single day something new um, has been happening in both Greece and Italy, in the Eurozone and so on, and it gives an indication of how serious this crisis is. British Prime Minister Cameron said every day the Eurozone crisis continues and every day it is not resolved is a day that has a chilling effect on the rest of the world economy including the British economy. A serious crisis is in play and we have to ask what is the task of socialists, people who consider themselves to be socialists or revolutionaries in such a contact? Well, as we always do, and nobody else seems to do, um, we'll return to Lenin on this question and start with Lenin's conception of a revolutionary situation in his important work, The Collapse of the Second International, which was written in 1915, quite a crucial time of world economic crisis during the First Imperialist War. He said that a revolutionary situation is a necessary precondition for a revolution. Well, not surprisingly. What are the characteristics, then, of a revolutionary situation? Lenin indicated three major ones. First, when it's impossible for the ruling classes to maintain their rule without any change. When there is a crisis in one form or another among the upper classes, amongst the ruling class. A crisis in the policy of the ruling class, leading to a fissure through which the discontent and indignation of the oppressed classes bursts forth. The upper classes should be unable to live in the old way. That's the first point. The upper classes should be unable to live in the old way. The second is when the suffering and want of the oppressed classes has grown more acute than usual. So that the lower classes, in most countries the vast majority, do not want to live in the old way. And thirdly, when as a consequence of the above causes, there is considerable increase in the activity of the masses, who, under normal times, uncomplainingly allow themselves to be robbed in peacetime, but in turbulent times are drawn both by all the circumstances of the crisis and by the upper classes themselves into independent historical action. So those are the three major points. The upper classes can't rule in the old way, the lower classes can't live in the old way. And third, as a result of these circumstances, there's mass political activity taking place in the countries concerned. Now these objective changes are independent of the will of not only of individual groups and parties, but even of individual classes. You can't cause them to happen by subjective means, by you know, pleading with people to take action on the streets and so on. It's independent of the will of individual groups and parties. As a general rule, a revolution is not possible without these developments. However, not all revolutionary situations give rise to a revolution. A revolution occurs when these objective changes are accompanied by a subjective change, that is the ability of the revolutionary class to take revolutionary action, revolutionary mass action, strong enough to break the old government, to overthrow the old ruling class. Not even in a period of deep crisis will the old ruling class fall by itself. It has to be toppled over. Mass struggles, revolts of an oppressed and persecuted class, while they are necessary preconditions for a revolutionary situation, do not guarantee revolution. The transformation is only possible when such struggles are led by a revolutionary party which can turn such spontaneous struggles into politically conscious ones to overthrow the existing order. That is, struggles which merge elemental destructive force of the masses and the conscious destructive force of the organization of revolutionaries. This requires, Lenin argued, the fusion of socialism or scientific socialism with the working class movement.
These are very stringent conditions. So it's a huge task we set ourselves if we want to overthrow the capitalist system. But we need to be convinced, as precondition for convincing others to join in this task, that the economic and social conditions are developing which will allow us to make progress in this direction. In some countries, huge convulsions have already taken place. The masses are already part of a historical process of changing their economic and social conditions. So if you look at um, Egypt, at Tunisia, um, you, know, you see some of these developments and you also see their limitations. In the imperialist countries, like Britain, that process has barely begun. But there are signs that the deep economic and financial crisis is pushing matters on. That is what we try to demonstrate in our economic analysis, or more precisely, our political economy of the current crisis. Capitalism is fracturing, and there appears to be no end to the global economic crisis. Understanding this has to be our starting point for the task ahead to see what lessons, what possibilities it opens out for building a political movement adequate to the historical tasks that face us. Every day brings news of an ever-deepening crisis of global capitalism as neoliberal economic policies continue to dominate in the major capitalist countries, reflecting the overwhelming power of financial capitalism. I mean, that's absolutely critically important. We're talking about the overwhelming power of financial capitalism in all the major imperialist countries. The US debt crisis remains unresolved. And the minimal measures put forward by President Obama to stimulate the US economy remain locked in the political stalemate of the US Congress. The diametrically polarised standpoints are now little more than political sparring as the ruling class prepares for next year's presidential elections. To date, no progress in reducing the overall budget deficit has been made in the United States. In the Eurozone, the sovereign debt crisis of the peripheral states is destabilising the Euro and undermining European Monetary U Union in its present form. Major divisions exist between the European ruling classes as to how to deal with this crisis. Stock markets are plunging with bank shares leading the fall as the global economy faces a new recession and the prospect of sovereign debt defaults in the Eurozone. In early August, unprecedentedly, the rating agency Standard & Poor's downgraded long-term US Treasury debt from its AAA status to AA+. It doesn't matter what that means. It means that it's saying you can't trust, in the old way, the United States to pay back its debts, its massive, massive debts. So it's questioning the creditworthiness of the US government debt. S&P said it doubted the efficacy of the plan that Congress and the administration had agreed to tackle the deficit and pointed to the weakened, quote, effectiveness, stability and predictability of US policy making and political institutions at a time when challenges are mounting. And the IMF estimates for US growth have been significantly reduced from one point to 1.5%, down from 2.5% predicted in June. I mean, you have to have a certain basic economic growth if unemployment um, is not going to grow, if capital is going to expand. And the, the, uh, you know, growth of 1.5% is not achieving this. The sovereign debt crisis in the 17 Eurozone countries has significantly deepened. Having devastated the economies of Greece, Ireland and Portugal, it's rapidly spreading to Italy and Spain, two of the world's 12 largest economies. So this means it's getting very, very serious. Greece faces economic and social collapse as it enters a third year of deep recession, driven by the austerity and privatisation programme demanded by the neoliberal Troika of the European Union, the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund in exchange for emergency funding. That's the bailout. 
interest rates on Spanish and Italian bonds already rose above 6% in August, the highest level since the creation of the euro. Italy's has now risen further to more than 7.5%, a level um, that makes uh, it a further candidate for an EU IMF bailout. And, you know, once that happens, it really does get serious because they have to accept an austerity programme imposed on them by the European Union and the International Monetary Fund and its impact on the rest of the Eurozone will be devastating. On the 14th of September, Italy's parliament finally passed a 54 billion euro austerity package in order to assuage the financial markets. I mean, it passed it in, in the, you know, the equivalent of the parliament. But what does it mean when you've got um, Berlusconi, I mean, actually leading um, the government? And in that context, um, it, was, it had no impact whatsoever. A week later, um, Italy's debt um, credit rating was cut, um, so its borrowing increased, and uh, it was said that a further downgrade was likely. Well, they've already happened, these further downgrades. Um, S&P said Italy's growth prospects were poor and that the austerity pr uh, package would have little impact on reducing Italy's 1.85 trillion euro uh, public debt. That's 1,850 billion um, euros debt. 1, 000, yeah, 1,850 billion. And that's 119% of its gross domestic product. Um, as I've already indicated, they had little confidence in Berlusconi or his government. Latest forecasts put Italy's growth at 0.6% in 2011, worsening to 0.3% in 2012. That means essentially no growth at all and no possibility of paying back your debt um, on the basis of a growing economy in those uh, circumstances. Um, other um, credit rating agencies cut Spain's rating to its fourth highest um, soon after and Moody's went further and cut it by two more notches to A1, which is its fifth highest rating. So you pay as your money, you take your choice in this macro game of the credit rating agencies. Overall, there's little belief among these agencies that the Eurozone is capable of resolving its problem. Interestingly enough, the EU has recently said that it's time to have new agencies and that it has no confidence whatsoever in the, these uh, three agencies that are based um, in the US. So if you don't like a message, get rid of the messenger. 78% of the debt uh, 1.9 trillion euro debt of Portuguese, Irish, Greek and, and, and Spain, that's excluding uh, um, Italy, is held within the European Union. And the increasing likelihood of Greece defaulting on its debt is putting pressure on French banks, which are the most exposed to Greek debt. On the 14th of September, credit rating agency Moody's downgraded two French banks and talked about downgrading a third. The exposure of these three banks alone to Greek government and commercial debt is more than 42 billion euros. French banks are now holding some 300 billion euros of Italian debt. So, I mean, you know, Greece is barely a, a, an issue compared to, uh, to Italy. And French banks have lost 50% of their stock market value over three months. While UK banks um, have only around 14 billion euros worth of Greek bonds, they have 75 billion in Italian and 103 billion in Spanish debt. Now these are sort of re relatively modest exposure for the City of London to uh, debt in the crisis hit countries. But what you have to remember is very much more is entwined in the markets for what are known as credit default squats. The bets banks and other investors, example hedge funds, make with each other to hedge against sovereign bank, uh, bankruptcy. So they're, you know, they're betting, essentially. They're using the money for no social purpose whatsoever. No purpose connected with production whatsoever. They're using it to bet with others. I mean, which I mean, country is liable to, to go bust first? <laughs>
And, you know, it's a betting game, which is what we saw a great deal of um, before the financial crisis broke out in 2008. Now, if these credit default swaps were triggered, in other words, if there was a default and these people who had, you know, betted on them called in their, their bets, it would have a devastating impact as banks, etc., began to wonder who owned what to whom and which contracts were to be honoured. In other words, you know, what happens with these uh, bets is they get mixed up with, you know, other um, financial instruments and then they're sold on. And you never quite know, you know, who owns them by the end of this process and who's going to admit to holding them. And whether even, you know, if you find out, whether they're going to actually agree to the honour their contracts. So, I mean, if, if such a default happens and this, um, you know, these... Uh, credit default swaps were triggered, that is, you know, people started asking for their money, um, I mean, it would just be totally devastating. This um, count, what's called counterparty risk, i.e. the risk with your counterparty, who you've done the bet with, can lead to bank funding markets drying up, and, to that, um, and that to a credit crunch similar to what occurred with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers in 2008. In other words, banks will say, we're not lending anybody. We don't trust anybody. You know, we can't be sure when we lend that the money is going to be paid back. And that will lead to a credit crunch, which means that banks are not fueling the capitalist system, right? And not allowing the money and the funds necessary for capitalism to expand, you know, to be available to companies, to to other banks and so on and so forth. And this will have a devastating effect on the whole of the capitalist system. In fact, it will bring it to a, <laughs> a thudding halt uh, and a Great Depression, another Great Depression. I think much greater than the Great Depression of the 1930s would be inevitable in, under these circumstances. Um, in early October, it's just as a matter of interest, one of the uh, Moody's downgraded the credit rating of 12 UK banks and building societies. I bet you didn't know that. I mean, in other words, you know, they're saying you can't trust them uh, to the extent that you could trust them before. In the UK, the condemns government's austerity program is starting to bite. Economic growth was already weak before most of the fiscal squeeze, that's the cuts in public spending and tax increases, were put in place by the government. It expects the economy will grow by just 1.1% this year, down from its 1.5 forecast in June. So that was an IMF forecast. IMF always gets everything wrong and always overestimates, you know, the growth that's going to take place. So every six months it has to, you know, revise its figures and, and put the growth rate down. Um, it advised the Chancellor to slow down the pace of deficit reduction in the event of a further underperformance of the economy. Most recently, the European Commission has cut the forecast for UK growth down to 0.7% in 2011, falling to 0.6% in 2012. That's how serious the situation is. I mean, it essentially means stagnation, a flat economy, no growth of any significance. Unemployment is growing and real incomes are falling with inequality and poverty on the rise. Um, public sector borrowing um, in August reached a higher than expected 15.9 billion, the highest total for an August on record, and in September it was 14.1 billion, bringing the total net debt, excluding the temporary effects of financial interventions, to 966.8 billion pounds, or 62.6% 6 of the gross domestic product. Slower growth means less tax revenues and higher welfare spending, and suggests that the government target date of 2015 for eliminating the public sector deficit is unrealistic. And there's been new research by the Financial Times which reinforces this conclusion. It's based on new lower estimates of the capacity, the spare capacity in the British economy, and it suggests that the structural deficit for 2011-12 will be some 12 billion higher than previously thought. We remain to, you know, to see what the outcome is of that, but it's serious. So the debt crisis is running out of control as international institutions, central banks and governments desperately search 
for measures to plug the financial holes that are now threatening the international banks. In mid-September, five of the world's leading central banks, the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of Japan, took determined concerted action to prevent a dollar funding crisis in Europe by announcing they would be pumping billions of dollars into the financial system over the coming months. The banks were finding it increasingly difficult to fund their day-to-day -day operations in adequate amounts from financial institutions alarmed by the Eurozone debt crisis, particularly the 10 largest US money market funds. In other words, they were not funding the system. You know, liquidity was disappearing within the system, which means the system can't grow, the system can't expand. And it's quite serious. Um, as a result of this, these developments, uh, a large number of banks on both sides of the Atlantic have had their credit rating um, um, downgraded. And the IMF re recently reported that the exposure of European banks to the crisis-ridden parts of the Eurozone has swollen to 300 billion euros since last year. It warned that time is running out to deal with the instability of the global financial system. So let me start to give you a little explanation of, in broad terms of what, what has happened while we've got to this point. The sovereign debt crisis in, is merely the second phase of the global crisis that erupted with the collapse of Lehman Brothers three years ago on the 15th of September 2008. That precipitated the biggest financial meltdown in history. Underlying this crisis was an over-accumulation of capital in the main imperialist countries. That is, capital was not producing sufficient profitability in order to expand adequately in relation to competitors. Now, when we talk about capitalism in this period, we're talking about monopoly capitalism. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, small competitive firms um, in, in the British economy, which do, as a matter of fact, employ the most labour, right, because they, they're not as capital intensive. But the large conglomerations of capital are incredibly capital intensive, right? <coughs> that is the relationship of the capital, the money spent on capital, the investment on capital, as opposed to the investment on, on jobs, on labour, on workers, right, is massive, absolutely massive. So, you know, they have to expand quite considerably to increase employment. And if they're not expanding at all, or, you know, even expanding at a much lower rate, then they're going to have very, very little impact on the rate of growth of employment. And it's quite important to, to, to recognise that. And why aren't they spending? Well, in their competition with other great large conglomerations of capital, other monopolies, I mean, they can see they're not going to make sufficient profits. They're not, in order to expand and improve their competitive position. So what do they do with that capital? Well, they hold it. I mean, I think in Gordon Brown's book, he said in the major um, capitalist countries, some 3,000 billion dollars 3,000 $3, billion dollars, 3 trillion dollars, remains on their balance sheets. What does that mean? It means it's there. They're not spending it. Because the returns needed in order to expand capital are inadequate for them to invest. And that's, that's what's going on everywhere. There's massive... Don't let anybody tell you there's a shortage of capital. There's a massive surplus of capital. But it's not being used for productive purposes. Because if it were used... I mean, it would actually probably make the situation worse for the, you know, the capitals that are spending it. So that's what we mean by an over-accumulation of capital. And, you know, this process started probably in the 1970s. And, but, you, can, you know, if you want to read about it, go to the articles on our website on globalisation. Anyway, this crisis led to the biggest recession since the 1930s. The capitalist system survived this process because the state underwrote the debts of the banks and financial institutions on a scale never seen before. 
By 2009, the total support for the financial system from governments and central banks reached an unprecedented 14,000 billion in the United Kingdom, the US and the Eurozone, almost equivalent to a quarter of global GDP. So this incredible amount of money was being used to, to basically bail out the banks. And since that time, central banks have pumped an additional $5,000 billion into the global financial system. Now, in, in order to stop the system from collapsing, states had to s invest, to spend masses of uh, capital on in investment in the public sector, on welfare and so on, to keep the system functioning. I mean, they had no choice. If the banks were to be saved, the state had to invest. And so the huge state debts run up to save the banks and to prevent capitalist economies falling into an even deeper recession, in turn, precipitated the sovereign debt crisis. Right? In other words, the massive indebtedness of capitalist states. So it all stemmed from the crisis, which in turn stemmed from the overaccumulation of capital in the, in, in the capitalist countries. But it all turns in the final analysis on saving the banks, the financial institutions, the massive financial institutions from collapsing. And that's why we have a sovereign debt crisis. The crisis is most severe in the smaller Eurozone states with weaker banks whose ruling class groups borrowed relatively huge sums at low Euro interest rates. Now what happened to try and keep the economies function, functioning was interest rates were cut and cut and cut and cut. I think they're 0.25% in, the, uh, in the United States, 0.5% in the UK. They're 1.25% now in the Eurozone. I mean, coming down massively from heights like 5, 6, 7% in some cases, in order to keep the system f turning over. The political divisions amongst the European imperialists on how to deal with the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis rest on disputes over saving their investments and limiting the in inescapable losses to their international financial institutions. It's these divisions that are threatening to destabilize the Eurozone and the European Union, and with them, the global financial system. So we can, you know, see how the process has developed. British banks, given their crucial role in the British economy, are seriously at risk from a breakup of the Eurozone, particularly the Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds and Santander UK. I actually, I was walking down the road and somebody offered me a leaflet collecting for Bernardo's and he had an RBS on the top, which is, you know, how the banks are trying to get themselves back in with, with ordinary people. Um, unbelievable. Adam Posner, member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, sees the Eurozone crisis as the biggest single threat to the global economy and to Britain in particular. He tells Sky News, it is bigger for the UK than for the US or for others who are not as tightly tied to Europe. Stephen King of um, HSBC said that a Euro breakup would be a disaster threatening another Great Depression. Disentangling the millions of contracts and cross-border assets, he said, would be a Herculean task that would surely threaten the fabric of the European financial system. Any recession in Europe would damage British exports. More than 40% of British exports go to the Eurozone and more than 50% go to the European Union. But it is the financial linkages that are of greatest concern with a breakup um, if, if there were a breakup of the Eurozone. Jans Larsen of RBC Capital Markets said, I don't think it is much of a guess to expect the resulting turmoil to wipe out what remains of the banking sector. He's talking about the British banking sector and therefore the City of London. What is happening in Greece serves as a warning to us all. As the imperialist root uh, ruthlessly loot and plunder the country's resources and wealth, driving hundreds of thousands of working people into abject poverty. 
the people of Greece are being made to pay for the capitalist crisis precipitated by the international banks so that the bank's investments and profits can be sustained or at least their losses can be limited. Driving this process forward is, as I've mentioned, the neoliberal troika of the EU, ECB and the IMF demanding ever greater austerity, cuts in public spending and deregulation before releasing the bailout funds needed to keep uh, Greece's economy just functioning. Now, Greece cannot pay back its debts, but it's part of the Eurozone. Sections of the European imperialists want to keep Greece in there, squeezing whatever they can out of the country before the inevitable default. They fear the consequences of an immediate default and the threat of its spreading to other Eurozone members. They support the ECB purchases of Eurozone government debt to stabilise the weaker Eurozone economies, including those of Italy and Spain. Other sections of the ruling class and the ruling elite do not support any further bailouts or ECB interventions and want Greece to default and leave the Eurozone, whatever the consequences. Major divisions exist in the German ruling class, um, in the German ruling class in the ruling German coalition government over this issue and in the population as a whole. Germany's member of the ECB's board, the European Central Bank's board, Jürgen Stark, abruptly resigned from the board over the issue of uh, the European Central Bank purchasing Europe's own government debt. Um, he simply resigned. He said, it's not allowed to do it. It's not part of the treaty. We shouldn't be doing it. It will cause inflation and, and so on and so forth. And the result of that was the euro fell and further turbulence on the world markets. Germany's economy minister, uh, who was the leader of the FDP, one of the coalition partners, a junior partner in, in Merkel's coalition government, said that they should discuss, if necessary, an orderly bankruptcy of Greece. The Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, also wants the possibility of a forced exit from the Eurozone by countries not complying with Eurozone budgetary rules. Actually, interesting enough, neither did France and Germany comply with Europe, Eurozone budgetary rules. But what they're talking about, what's um, in, on offer, um, is having basically a European or Eurozone of Northern Europe, of the strong economies in nor Northern Europe, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and so on, uh, and, you know, letting the weaker countries uh, go out. I mean, that's what they want. And that's, in, in one sense, makes sense, right? Because what they want to create is a European imperialism which can actually challenge the United States or can stand up to the United States and the I presume, you know, the rising Asian economies. Both uh, the US and Britain are horrified by the lack of leadership uh, among Europe's politicians to stabilise the Eurozone and avoid a market meltdown. Um, the US Treasury Secretary, Timothy Geithner, he took the unprecedented step of attending the mid-September European Union Finance Ministers meeting to urge European leaders to speed up the ratification of what was then the 21st of July this year agreement to set up a bailout fund to help stricken members of the Eurozone. And he wanted various things to happen, that the European Financial Stability Fund, um, it, the amount of money available to it would be raised way above the 440 billion euros that it has so far. And at the same meeting, British Chancellor George Osborne said that it is in Britain's interest that the Eurozone is stable. He indicated his support for the European um, Central Bank's purchase of bonds of Eurozone countries. He was in favour of a U EU treaty changes to further integrate the Eurozone and strengthen fiscal integration as long as Britain plays no part in greater European integration. He said that there is a remorseless logic that leads from monetary union to fiscal union, but it is clear that British interests in financial services will have to be protected. This is, you know, in remarkable arrogance from a Chancellor desperate to protect the global interests of the City of London without provoking the Euro skeptics in his own party. I mean, the Tories have been asso associated with being anti. Europe. 
So we have this incredible situation where a chancellor uh, of Britain, you know, the most sort of Eurosceptic, from the most Eurosceptic party in Britain, is calling for further integration of the uh, uh, EU, of the Eurozone in particular. And, and basically is talking for a you know, political u uh, union of a number of countries in Europe in order to have some kind of stable financial process in the Eurozone. Uh, it just, I mean, you can in, it gives you an indication of how serious this crisis is. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't, you couldn't have conceived of this ten years ago. Absolutely impossible. Anyway, to move on, um, what's clear is... Uh, as I said, um, it was said in the article on the front of the paper, is that the leading European powers, Germany and France, will be forced to take all the steps necessary to protect the euro and sustain the eurozone. They have little option but to resolve the divisions in their own ranks and between the main eurozone nations if the European imperialism is to maintain its challenge to US imperialist dominance of the global economy. In other words, it is not, it cannot allow the euro to fall. The euro has to be sustained in the interests of the dominant forces of European imperialism. I mean, otherwise, Europe um, is finished. I mean, essentially, in terms of the battle for the division of the world and the investments and product, yeah, looting and plundering that's going on of, of the world. Um, <coughs> if it doesn't sustain the euro and the eurozone in some form or other. Anyway, so, th you know, everything that's been going on in the last week or so is about this. The weekend of the 22nd, 23rd of October saw an EU summit intended to finalise an agreement between Germany and France on a plan to resolve the eurozone sovereign debt crisis. And it was... That weekend, it soon became clear that it was not possible to complete an agreement um, as insufficient progress was actually being made. Um, and also, with whatever agreement they made being acceptable to Merkel's coalition in the Bundestag, the Germans, Germany's parliament. So a further summit was called later in the week. So they had a summit over the weekend, and then another one, which actually was on the Wednesday afterwards, and it actually continued into the Thursday when they uh, uh, came up uh, with an agreement. Now, that agreement, I mean, basically, was um, that um, those holding uh, Greek bonds um, would have to accept what they called a voluntary haircut, I like that term, um, of 50% losses on their, their, their investments um, in Greek private debt. The European Financial... Uh, stability, uh, what's it called, the European, <laughs> EFS anyway, this stability fund, um, was to be leveraged four to five times to give it the firepower of something like 1,000 billion euros, i.e. a trillion euros. What they mean is that um, instead of backing all the debt, um, you know, the, the defaults, you back a certain percentage. You say you'll back you know, 20% of the debt. So if you back 20% of the debt, then the fund is increased five times. If you back 30%, it's less, right, and so on and so forth. They haven't sorted it out yet, but they need at least a 1,000 billion euros and, and possibly more if the system um, is going to be sustained. Um, there'll be a new package of 130 billion euros bailout package for Greece, um, which is up from the 109 billion was up, uh, what, that was decided on the 21st of um, July um, in the big agreement on the 21st of July, but it won't be sufficient. And in order to get that pa pe uh, passage, Greece is certainly um, going to uh, suffer. So, i.e., it's only going to get the money if it agrees even further austerity on what it's agreed already. In other words the Greek people are going to be made to pay even more from um, the crisis. But as Sarkozy uh, said um, before that summit, allowing the destruction of the euro is to take the risk of the destruction of Europe. Those who destroy Europe and the euro will bear responsibility for a resurgence of conflict 
and division on our con uh, continent, referring to the period of wars um, uh, on the European continent from um, you know, 1914 to the end of the Second World War. Then, thinking they've got this agreement and all the markets started going up and the euro rose and, uh, you know, uh, Papandreou, the president, uh, the prime minister of Greece, then caused <laughs> turmoil again in the markets by deciding on the 31st of October that, uh, that first the Greek people had to accept the austerity package that was being imposed on them. And he called for a, a referendum. Um, he was soon put right on this and shown who was calling the shots when he was summoned to a meeting with Sarkozy and Merkel before the G20 summit, the tw summit of 20 nations, um, on the 4th or 5th of November. We're getting quite near to this date now, so, you know, these things are happening every day. Um, the 8 billion Greek aid due from a package even earlier, the May, May 2010 bailout package, was immediately suspended. Um, a few days later, the referendum was called off, and Papandreou stepped down as Prime Minister and called for a government of national unity to force the austerity measures through. He said the, co the country could not risk a no vote of four on the 4th of December, which is the date he chose for the referendum. I mean, he knows the country would have voted against it in the final analysis, or he was told if that happened, then he was threatening the whole stability of uh, the Eurozone and the um, EU. So he changed his mind, and he's now no longer Prime Minister. And they put in um, some technocrat. Does anybody remember his name? No? Okay, well, I'll just have to look it up. His name is Lucas Papandemos. He's 64 years old. He has a physics master's degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was professor of economics in the US and Greece. He was a Bank of Greece governor, vice president of the ECB, economics advisor to George Papandreou, the prime minister. That's who he is, i.e. a neoliberal of solid foundation and he will make sure that the austerity pre uh, package is driven through uh, right meanwhile further negotiations continue over the supplementary austerity measures needed before the troika releases this um, 8 billion EU IMF payment which was part as I said of last year's agreement necessary for the Greek government to pay salaries and pensions in October well October has gone I don't know if Presumably he hasn't paid the salaries and pensions, but he desperately needs this money um, to, uh, I mean, at least, you know, hold back the turbulence that's actually taking place um, in Greece at the present time. Um, the Greek government tried to propose a new tax on property, which was expected to raise about 2 billion euros, um, but that wasn't considered enough to release its funds. It, it has been put in place. But they're being forced to collect this tax through electricity bills as tax workers refuse to collect it. Uh, tax workers simply say, we're not collecting this tax. So they had to find a way of getting it, and they're doing it through electricity bills. Um, and in September, the government proposed further measures, which was 20 to 30% cuts in pensions above 1,200 uh, euros a month. The tax thresholds on earnings to fall from €8,000 to 5000 and the number of state employees on partial pay, that's about 60% of salary, is to be raised from 20,000 to 30,000. 30, and just say, you know, simply, you're on 60% of salary. Your salary is cut by 40%, right? Take it or leave it. The austerity program is draconian and is destroying the Greek economy. The GDP fell by a further 7.3% in the second quarter of 2011. Unemployment has reached 900,000 in a population of 11 million and is projected to reach 
um, million in the, in the next few months. The debt to GDP ratio could reach 200% in 2013, up from 115% in 2009. This is how the imperialists plunder and loot the Greek economy in the interests of the imperialist banks. The latest package extends the austerity measures, tax increases, and so on, and includes a 50 billion euro privatization program. In other words, handing, I mean, basically, um, companies and buildings and so on to the uh, imperialist banks or those that have got the funds to invest in them. Strikes, riots and demonstrations have become daily features of Greek political life. Uh, wildcat strikes have prevented officials from finalising next year's budget figures demanded by the Troika before it will release the payments uh, necessary to keep the government functioning. Striking civil servants blocked access to the Greece's statistical agency in Athens so they couldn't do their work in order to find out what was actually happening. Um, to the economy. Rubbish is piling up in the streets and ministers are locked out of their offices. The finance minister Evangelos Venizelos has been unable to enter his office. Um, well, it, when I did this, it was over the past uh, previous two weeks. I don't know whether he's managed to get in his office in the recent period, but there you go. A uh, two-day general strike on the 19th and 20th of October called by the unions to protest at the parliamentary debate and vote on the latest measures demanded by the Troika exploded into violence and anger. One trade unionist died after being tear-gassed. As one of the 100,000 strong protesters gathered in St. Tagmas Square outside the Parliament put it, the message we want to send abroad and here at home is that we are not going to accept these policies lying down. The Secretary General of the Civil Service Union concurred, our European friends should know that our Prime Minister will go to the EU summit naked because the promises he will make will have no backing in this country. The measures will be impossible to implement. So the lower classes, if you like, are making it clear they're not prepared to live in the old way. The struggle um, in Greece is far more advanced than that of the other Eurozone countries bailed out by the EU IMF. Portugal will not meet its fiscal targets agreed with uh, the EU and IMF as part of its 78 billion euro package unless it accepts further austerity measures. The economy is expected to contract 1.9% this year and a further 2.2% in 2012 in the deepest recession for 30 years. Unemployment will reach a record 13.4% next year. Public sector pay will be cut by 20% in 2012 compared with 2010. Social unrest in Portugal has remained relatively low key. 50,000 demonstrated in Lisbon and, and Porto in mid-October as part of a global day of protest. The unions have called a one-day general strike for some time in November. As far as I know, there's little significant protest in Ireland. I mean, but it gives you some sense of what is actually happening to people in these countries. When I say, you know, Greece shows us what's in store for us in order to solve the um, crisis of capitalism, these are the kind of measures that have, you know, barely started. And meanwhile, Italy has become the centre of concern. The G20 summit ended with little progress being made and disagreement rate details of the package agreed at the EU summit. However, Berlusconi has been forced to agree to step down in favour of a new government to drive through the austerity measures to force Italy's government deficit down. And as I talk, this process is still being played out. Um, so, I mean, basically... The guy who is now going to take over the, uh, the Italian government is called Mario Monti. You want to know about Mario Monti? Um, he's 68. He has a degree in economics and management for Bocconi University and then graduate studies at Yale. He had two stints as EU commissioner and he's now head of Bocconi and newly appointed lifetime senator in Italy. He was appointed by the president of two days ago, as a lifetime senator, which would allow him to take over the government. You know, they can do things when they have to, very, very quickly. Um, anyway, he's another neoliberal who will no doubt tie, try and make the Italian uh, working class pay for the financial crisis.
So, Greece shows us the shape of things to come. In this country, the condemned government's austerity programme is driving the UK economy back into recession. Poverty and inequality are rising, wages are falling and unemployment is growing. And the Vickers Commission report, if you remember this report on banking, how to control the banks and stop them having another financial crisis, I mean, turned out to be a damn squib. Um, unemployment is now 2.57 million, 8.1% <coughs> of uh, the economically active population. Unemployment among 16 to 24 year, uh, year olds was 991,000 in the three months to August 2011, that's the latest figures, 21.3% of the age group. In other words, 21.3% of young people are unemployed, have no job. Um, the figure is 30% in Italy and 40% in Spain. I mean, just consider that. 40% of young people in Spain have no job, have no future, have no prospects. Um, the number of women unemployed was 1.07 million, up 44,000 on the three months to May, the highest for 23 years. And the inactivity rate was 23.3%, with 9.3 million 16 to 64-year-olds not in work. I mean, as the growth rate slows down, unemployment will grow rapidly. 111,000 jobs were lost from the public sector in three months to June 2011, with only 41,000 created in the rest of the economy. So, I mean, essentially, um, things are going to get much worse. We'll get the latest figures in, a, in, in about 10 days. The real income of British households fell by 0.8% in 2010. That doesn't sound a great deal, but when you realise it's been growing all the time. I mean, throughout all the crisis since the Thatcher years, you realise what a fall um, in uh, household income actually represents. And that was the first fall since 1981, right? According to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, it's expected to fall by more than 10% over the next three years, with those on the lowest incomes, the poorest 30%, suffering most from the condemned government's austerity measures. 29% of children, that's 3.8 million children, live in poverty, and this is expected to grow by two percentage points, or 300,000, over the next three years. And Britain has very, very high rates of inequality. Um, average earnings fell last year. They increased by under 1.8%, well below the rate of inflation. The CPI annual rate of inflation reached 5.2% in September, up from 4.5%, the highest since the series began in 1997. It's interesting now the government's saying, well, I don't know, we should actually uprate benefits and pensions on the basis of the uh, CPI, because it's now grown to 5.2%. I mean, you know, they thought it would fall down to well under 2% and be well below the retail price indexes, which is what they used before. But it's actually catching up with it. The retail price index was 5.6% in September, and the uh, CPI, as I said, was 5.2%. More than 20% of British workers are earning less than a living wage, which is said to be £8.30 um, £8 an hour in London and £7.20 an hour outside the capital. Between 1978 and 2008, income of the top 10% of wage earners doubled in real terms, while that of the bottom 10% rose by 27%. In 2010, the median pay of the FTSE 100 companies, the top companies in this country, their chief executives, rose by 32% to £3.5 million, more than treble the rise of the actual index itself. Their pay is now 145 times the average salary, and the multiple was something like 69 times in 1999. In addition, the poorer sections of the population experience a higher rate of inflation than the rich, so inequality will continue to grow. As the Lib Dem, conf uh, the Lib Dem conference, Vince Cable, a minister in the coalition government, compared the economic crisis to a war. He should, of course, said a class war. At the end of the article, in 
the last issue of our paper, we said the bankers continue to rule as austerity grows. The rich get richer and wages fall. Tinkering with the British economy will change nothing. Resistance is inevitable and the riots of early August are an early warning sign to the ruling class. Capitalism is fracturing. We must hasten its downfall. That's what was said at the end of the article, which in a sense has a certain element of uh, hope, maybe wishful thinking, um, contained in it, because it's very hard in the context of Britain to, um, I mean, actually say what is possible when there's no movement, where the trade unions are literally doing nothing, where anything that's taken place has been, I mean, stood on quite um, viciously, as, as Bob indicated, even with the um, student demonstration that happened a couple of days ago. Anyway, I received a letter about this article, and I want to end by reading out this letter. It said, the rest of me, it was a wonderfully clear article you wrote about the global crisis, absolutely explaining the reasons. Now I think you ought to write an equally detailed article about the solutions. The steps that could be taken to control global capitalism, etc. Because I really don't think saying organise on placards will do anything. Is there no way within the political system we have to control the markets? Or is revolution the only way? And if so, I think we're doomed because it won't happen. You might say, just read Marx, it's all there. But I'm not going to, and nor is anybody else. So you've got to write it again so we can all get out and argue our case for transitional change. That's a letter from, for those of you who are around my age, um, the partner of um, Dad's Army guy. What was his first name? You know Dad's Army? Anybody Clive here? Dunn. Some people might know. Clive I don't Dunn. know. Clive, Clive Dunn. Dunn. It's uh, from Silidon, who uh, take, is a supporter of uh, our newspaper and, and sends money to our fund and you know keeps in touch with us. So I've tried to give an answer to Silidon, but not along the line she expected. For the aim of this contribution is been to show how only the deepening crisis of capitalism will begin to create the economic, social and political conditions for the overthrow of the system, and then only with the existence of a revolutionary movement that is strong enough to merge in Lenin's terms the elemental destructive force of the masses and the conscious destructive force of the organisation of revolutionaries. In other words, you can't control the system, you can't control the markets, there is no choice but to recognise, you know, the future, as uh, many have said in the socialist movement, is socialism or barbarism. And Greece sh gives us an inkling of the kind of barbaric measures that the ruling class have got in store for all of us as this crisis deepens and develops. Thank you.